So my name is Diane Mathis. I'm a professor of immunology at Harvard Medical School. My two talks have to do with immunological tolerance, in particular T cell tolerance. In the first talk, I'll relate some general concepts and then go on to um, define and describe the major mechanisms of tolerance. And then in the second talk, I'll focus on one particular mechanism of enforcing uh, to tolerance. So some general concepts. The major function of the immune system is to fight off microbial challenges. It does this by mobilizing its two major arms, uh, the innate response and the adaptive response. The innate response comes in early, and it's quite stereotypic. Uh, it's a hardwired system uh, that includes cells like macrophages and neutrophils. The adaptive um, uh, response comes in a little bit later, and um, it's a more nuanced response. The major players in the adaptive uh, response are B and T lymphocytes. Now, these cells have displayed on their surfaces receptors that are spe specific for particular antigens. The B cell receptor, or BCR, uh, for B cells, which is also called immunoglobulin, and the T cell receptor, or TCR, for T cells. Now, in general, each B or T cell uh, has multiple copies of a receptor that sees one particular antigen or a group of structurally related uh, antigens. So you can understand that in order to fight off the myriad of microbial challenges, that the repertoire must be both big uh, and diverse. And this happens by random rearrangement of um, gene segments encoding variable regions of the T and B cell receptors as these cells are differentiating uh, in the thymus for T cells and in the bone marrow uh, for B cells. And since, since it is uh, a random process, just by chance, sometimes specificities will be generated that are able to recognize the body's own constituents. For example, um, a T cell may see insulin, uh, or it may see the acetylcholine receptor, or it may see myelin basic protein. And if these uh, T cells are let loose, they would cause autoimmune attack on the pancreas, or myasthenia gravis, or uh, multiple sclerosis, which is autoimmune attack in the central nervous system. Now, since this is a very dangerous problem for the individual, uh, through evolution, multiple mechanisms of uh, immunological tolerance uh, have come into play. Now, these are generally um, uh, divided into central and peripheral mechanisms. Central tolerance has to do with the primary lymphoid organs where T cells or B cells are generated. So for T cells uh, in the thymus, so the antigens that would be dealt with uh, in central tolerance would be antigens that are expressed in the thymus or are uh, expressed in all cells or are expressed in cells which are trafficking through the thymus, like blood cells, for example. Uh, peripheral tolerance has to do with those cells uh, once they've emerged from the thymus and are now in the periphery and can see uh, potential self-antigens in the liver or in the heart or in various uh, tissues. Now, the major mechanisms of central tolerance are uh, first clonal deletion, which is physical removal of that particular T cell from the repertoire, clonal inactivation, where the T cell um, uh, is there, but once it, get, it gets into the periphery, it's no longer able to uh, make a response. And then clonal diversion, the T cell is there and it can respond, but during its differentiation, uh, it uh, gave up its identity as an effector T cell, which is 
uh, the kind of cell which actually does the damage, uh, and has taken on the mantle of another kind of cell, a regulatory cell. The mechanisms of peripheral tolerance uh, are somewhat similar. So the first three are the same, deletion and activation and diversion. But onto this are added three more. So clonal ignorance just refers to the fact that some T cells can escape, but they're quite fine because the antigen that they see is hidden uh, from the uh, lymphocyte circulation. So for example, it might be an antigen which is in a cell that's behind the blood-brain barrier, or it might be an antigen which is in the eye, which is thought to be quote-unquote immune privileged, or an antigen which is in the testis. And so normally these are not seen unless there's some kind of damage uh, to these different tissues which releases the antigen into the circulation. Helplessness refers to the fact that many B cell and uh, cytotoxic T cell responses um, must have help from CD4 positive helper cells in order uh, to respond effectively. So as you can imagine, you might not need to directly tolerize that B cell or that cytotoxic T cell, but rather the CD4 positive T cells that are helping them. And then finally, suppression, uh, which is a major mechanism, refers to the fact, uh, refers to uh, cells which keep in check the activity of effector T cells. So looking at that um, net of mechanisms which I showed you, you might be tempted to think uh, that this is very comprehensive and autoimmunity uh, should be rare. But breaks in tolerance do occur, leading to autoimmunity and in most extreme form to autoimmune disease. And they occur quite often, uh, five to eight of the percent of the population in Western uh, countries have some form of an autoimmune disease. And they occur by different means. So um, at the last um, calculation, there are more than 80 different types uh, of autoimmune diseases. And they probably double that because sometimes we lump together a particular um, autoimmune disease just because they have the same manifestations, for example, arthritis, but the way to get there might be actually quite different. So let's uh, look a little bit more closely into central tolerance. And I'd like to focus on the first mechanism that I mentioned, clonal deletion. Now, as I said, clonal deletion is physical removal of the self-reactive T cells from the repertoire. And this is a quite um, important mechanism because fully two-thirds of the T cells that reach full maturity in the thymus uh, actually undergo clonal deletion because they have some self-reactivity. And it's also the most definitive mechanism because it ends in death, and you can't be more definitive than that. Um, so I'd like to uh, tell you um, more about this mechanism of clonal deletion. But before I do that, I have to uh, explain to you how T cells see antigen and how they differentiate in the thymus. So a T cell actually sees its antigen quite differently from how a B cell sees its antigen. B cells uh, uh, see antigens through their B cell receptor or immunoglobulins very directly. Uh, they actually recognize a piece of the three-dimensional structure and then make a response. T cells, it's quite different. They um, must recognize uh, a short peptide sequence, a primary sequence uh, presented by major histocompatibility complex molecules which occur at the surface of uh, most cell types. Now, this presentation of antigens to T cells is a quite complicated and very elegant mechanism, which uh, if you're interested in, you can refer to the talk uh, by Dr. Melman, which goes into much more detail. But suffice it to say, in this context, an antigen would be either synthesized by a cell or taken up by a cell, and then undergoes uh, proteolytic degradation to make peptides. 
And according to where that peptide was actually made and what enzymes were involved, as well as the primary sequence of the peptide, it can bind either to an MHC class two molecule or an MHC class one molecule. And then these uh, molecules shuttle the peptides to the surface. Now, some T cell receptors can see uh, a peptide in the context of an MHC class II molecules. And it does this with the help of the CD4 co-receptor. And these T cells turn out to be CD4 positive helper T cells. Other T cells uh, have receptors that are capable of recognizing MHC class I molecules and peptides within them. And they're helped along uh, with the co-receptor CD8. And these cells turn into CD8 positive cytotoxic T cells. Now, as I mentioned, T cells undergo differentiation in the thymus. Uh, the precursor, which gives rise to a T cell, comes from the fetal liver uh, or the bone, adult bone marrow. And these precursors are really very ignorant. So um, they must go through a number of processes in the thymus to educate them. They must learn uh, their antigen specificity, and they do this uh, by rearrangement of the T cell receptor genes. They must um, have an enrichment for T cells which are able to see the MHC molecule uh, that the individual is expressing, but not see it so well um, that it might cause autoimmunity. So these are positive selection and negative selection events. And then fin finally, phenotypic specialization uh, takes place. So I mentioned that there are CD8 positive cytotoxic T cells and CD4 positive helper T cells. And these are what we call effector cells, which um, get the job done in an immune response. There are also CD4 positive regulatory T cells, which control the activities of these effector cells. Now, this all takes place in the thymus by a, uh, a, an orchestrated uh, series of events. The precursors enter uh, through the blood vessels at the corticomedullary junction. And then they percolate uh, through the cortex and the medulla, coming into contact with various stromal cell types that express MHC uh, molecules with peptide at their surface and also produce different uh, cytokines and have different other types of receptors on their surface. And through this uh, series of uh, contacts, these different uh, processes, which are so important for the life of the T cell, take place. Now, it's possible to monitor this using flow cytometry, uh, using the CD4 and CD8 co-receptors as markers of the differentiation pathway. So when the precursor enters uh, from the blood, it doesn't express either CD4 or CD8. Uh, and during this early time period, uh, it's basically undergoing cell division and um, is uh, starting gene rearrangement. Now, all of this takes place inside uh, the uh, cortex. Now, uh, eventually, CD4 and CD8 are both turned on to have the double positive stage, which also takes place in the cortex. Now, immunoglobulin, uh, sorry, T cell receptor gene rearrangement uh, is completed uh, during this double positive stage. Uh, and these cells are then ready uh, to be positively and negatively selected. Um, if they are positively selected and deemed worthy of uh, final maturation, they become either CD4 single positive if they saw an MHC class II molecule with peptide, or CD8 positive if they saw an MHC class I molecule with peptide. And this final step of differentiation happens as the cells are entering uh, the medulla. So the fate uh, of uh, a differentiating T cell is very much focused on these molecules that I've portrayed here. The interaction between the T cell receptor and co-receptors and the MHC uh, molecules. And it has to do with uh, the affinity uh, of this interaction, so how strongly 
uh, the T-cell receptor can see this complex, and the avidity, how many T-cell receptor and MHC complexes actually become engaged on a particular uh, set of cells. So with uh, the least amount of interaction, so no interaction, or with the strongest interaction, death uh, is the outcome. So with little interaction, the cell will die because of neglect, doesn't get any signaling, uh, within three days of becoming a double positive cell. Now with very strong um, uh, interaction, clonal deletion will take place, and that cell is removed from the repertoire. Now with a signal that's a little bit stronger, uh, that's quite weak, but stronger than nothing, uh, naive T cells uh, will continue maturation and eventually leave the thymus. And these will be both CD4 and CD8 positive T cells, depending upon whether the MHC molecule was class one or class two. And then somewhere between the naive T cell and clonal deletion, uh, there's clonal diversion. And that signal leads to uh, the changing of the effector T cell phenotype to a regulatory T cell, as I described before, or perhaps uh, a cell which gets shunted off to the intestine where it's um, uh, rather innocuous. So um, I'd like to show you some examples of uh, clonal deletion. And the most striking ones come from T cell receptor transgenic mice. So unfortunately, any particular T cell specificity is very rare in an individual. It's usually only one in 10 to the fourth to one in 10 to the six T cells are one particular specificity. That means that that T cell receptor sees a particular antigen. And that's very difficult to study and follow these cells. So the trick that immunologists play is uh, to take a T cell clone, which they know the specificity for, and they know where it came from, and they take the already rearranged T cell receptor genes from that T cell clone and use those to make transgenic mice with. And since those are already rearranged, they shut down endogenous rearrangement, and you end up with a transgenic mouse where the repertoire is highly skewed for that transgene encoded T cell receptor. So in one case, um, investigators started with a T cell clone uh, that was uh, CD8 positive and recognized an antigen which is male specific, and that's called the HY antigen because it's encoded on the Y chromosome. And they took those T cell receptor genes and made TCR transgenics, and they looked at differentiation in the thymus. And what they saw at steady state was that, uh, yes, you get double negatives as expected, you get double positives, and then the single positives are primarily CD8 positive because the clone that you started with was a CD8 positive T cell. Now this is in females where the HY antigen uh, does not exist. If instead you look in males that are TCR transgenic, what you find is you get double negatives and you don't see any other T cells after that. They've been clonally deleted. Now another example comes from a T cell clone that is CD4 positive, and it sees an antigen uh, which is uh, found in the blood, and it's called the C5 antigen. It's a complement uh, protein. And when people made these T cell receptor transgenics, in a, in a line of mice that naturally does not have C5, they find that there are double negatives, double positives, and primarily CD4 single positive cells. However, if instead they look on a line where C5 does exist, they find double negatives and double positives, but no CD4 single positives. Now from this one slide, you can already learn several things about clonal deletion. First of all, um, clonal deletion happens to both CD4 positive and CD8 positive T cells. And then secondly, it can occur at, in different places at different stages during T cell differentiation. So um, in the top case, we had an antigen uh, which is male specific, and it's a ubiquitous antigen found on all cell types. So as soon as T cells as double positives have finished the rearrangement of their T cell receptors, 
they get deleted. Um, and there's no T cells available for continuing maturation. It's a different case with this C5 antigen, which is found in the blood, because blood circulates through the thymus uh, in the medullary region and not in the cortical region. And so double positives never see this antigen, and it's only when the T cells are fully mature and move into the medulla that clonal deletion occurs. In fact, clonal deletion can even occur uh, in the periphery uh, under certain uh, conditions. So the mechanism of clonal deletion is apoptosis. And I think this is nicely shown by the experiment uh, illustrated on this slide. So here, people um, are dealing with a T cell whose receptor uh, sees a quite common antigen uh, and sees it in the, in the medulla. And, what they and the way they look for clonal deletion is to use what's called the tunnel assay, which is an assay which radioactively labels uh, free DNA ends, uh, which are um, generated during the process of apoptosis. And so you can see at the top, when the antigen is present, uh, that there's a lot of apoptosis occurring in the medulla, a little bit in the cortex, but mostly in the medulla. However, when the antigen is absent, you don't see uh, these apoptotic structures. As an example of how important uh, clonal deletion can be, uh, one should uh, recognize the fact that there are human autoimmune diseases which reflect uh, deficits in clonal deletion. So in, uh, in one example, uh, there's a mutation in a transcription factor uh, which is um, important as a general uh, effector of um, immunological tolerance. Uh, and so what happens is that these individuals get a multi-organ autoimmune disease called autoimmune polyglandular syndrome type 1. In the second example, it's a quite specific deficit in central tolerance. Uh, having to do with expression of the insulin gene in the thymus. And these individuals specifically develop uh, type 1 diabetes. Now, the first example will uh, form the basis uh, of my second talk, so I won't uh, go any further on that now. But I will give you a little bit of information, uh, more information about the second uh, example. So people have done a number of genetic studies and identified several genes which um, predispose to the development of type 1 diabetes in humans or protect from the development of type 1 diabetes. Now, the most important one of these genes is the HLA locus, which is the equivalent of the MHC gene, which I introduced you to. But the second most important is actually the insulin gene itself. Now, the variation in the uh, diabetes predisposing versus the diabetes protective insulin gene is not in um, the coding region of the insulin gene, but rather in the promoter region where there's um, a class of sequences called uh, variable number of tandem repeats, just a bunch of repeated sequences. Um, and depending upon how many of these sequences there are in the promoter region, the allele is either uh, diabetes promoting or diabetes protective. So when there are just a few of these repeats, it's diabetes promoting. And when there are more, it's diabetes protective. So if we look um, through the population at these alleles that have either protective or promoting VNTRs, what we find is that those people who have uh, the protective, the, the promoting allele, predisposing allele, develop diabetes more, much more commonly uh, than the population in general. And those are the examples on your left. Now, the ones on your right are those individuals who have two copies of the protective allele. And you can see that they develop diabetes much less frequently than the general population. And then, <clears throat> if you look to see what these um, variations in the promoter regions due to insulin gene expression, 
what you find is that there's not much difference in the expression of insulin in the pancreas. Where there is a big difference is actually in expression of insulin in the thymus. And people have um, made the um, speculation that those cases where there's higher expression, uh, for example, with the class 3 alleles, um, these people have more expression of insulin, greater clonal deletion in the thymus, and then less development of autoimmunity. And this has actually been modeled uh, in mice by making transgenic mice, which are expressing uh, the different types of uh, human alleles. And the results uh, fit very well uh, this idea. So I hope I've convinced you by now that central tolerance, and in particular clonal deletion, is an important mechanism of immunological tolerance. However, clonal dele deletion is never complete. Uh, there are antigens which are not expressed in the thymus, or they're um, not expressed. Um, there are antigens which T cells don't see with a high enough affinity, or uh, there are antigens whose concentration in the thymus is not high enough to permit clonal deletion. And one might actually uh, make the statement that it would be devastating if clonal deletion was actually complete. Because as you can imagine, uh, if you deleted uh, all the T cells that saw any antigen with any um, uh, affinity, that there would be a very small repertoire that would emerge into the periphery and not be able to uh, fight off the millions and millions of microbes uh, that the uh, individual is going to encounter. So that um, leaves open uh, the, the space for peripheral T cell tolerance. And I'm going to focus on one particular uh, and important mechanism of peripheral tolerance, and that's uh, suppression. As I mentioned, suppression is regulation of the behavior of self-reactive T cells by other T cells, by other cells. Um, this is, again, an important mechanism, and that can be seen very clearly uh, by the phenotype of either humans or mice uh, who are lacking uh, a particular kind of regulatory T cell, um, suppressor T cell. Uh, and these people get a very severe uh, autoinflammatory disease. And in fact, there are more uh, than just this type of uh, suppressor cell that keep um, effector T cells in check. There are actually several uh, types. Uh, T cells, uh, some people think some B cell suppressor cells, and also some macrophage uh, suppressor cells. But I'm going to focus my comments on one very famous uh, regulatory T cell, the most famous uh, T cell in immunology, actually. Uh, and these are uh, regulatory T cells which express the transcription factor of FOXP3, and we call them uh, affectionately uh, T reg cells. So these T cells express the alpha-beta T cell receptor, the CD4 co-receptor. And they express high levels of um, the high affinity receptor for IL-2. And this molecule is called CD25. And that was used for many years as a means to distinguish them from other types of T cells. But later, it was found that these T cells are actually a particular lineage of T cells and what defines that lineage is the transcription factor FOXP3. Now, normally circulating uh, through the body of uh, just a standard person or mouse, about 5 to 15 percent of the CD4 positive T cells are these FOXP3 positive regulatory T cells. And their importance uh, became very clear when it was understood that humans uh, that have the IPEX disease and mice that have the scurfy disease have a very severe autoinflammatory uh, disease affecting many organs because they are missing FOXP3. Uh, they have a mutation in it. And sub consequently, they are missing this population of regulatory T cells. Now, as I mentioned, these uh, T cells are generated, most of them are generated in the thymus uh, 
uh, by the process of clonal diversion. In other words, their T cell receptors see a self antigen expressed in the thymus at uh, an intermediate affinity between uh, what a naive T cell uh, sees and uh, allows it to undergo maturation and a uh, clonally deleted uh, T cell that undergoes negative selection sees. By now, using uh, gain of function and loss of function experiments, it's been determined that Tregs actually control almost all types of immune responses. They control autoimmune diseases like inflammatory bowel disease or type 1 diabetes. They uh, control inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, allergic diseases such as asthma. Uh, they also uh, keep in check graft rejection. Um, they um, promote tumor escape and they inhibit uh, the response of um, various types of infections. So uh, from graft rejection up, the regulatory T cells uh, are the good guys. The more you have, the less disease you have. From tumors down, the regulatory T cells are the bad guys. So the more Tregs you have, the less chance uh, the individual has of mounting an immune response against the tumor. And the same thing uh, for infections. Um, it was found um, that regulatory T cells, uh, as I've said, are critical for controlling uh, all types of inflammatory responses in the body, and actually that this happens throughout life. And uh, that was determined by looking at mice where it was possible to uh, um, ablate regulatory T cells by deleting the FOXP3 gene. And so if this was done uh, from birth on, it was very clear that the mice were very sick. Uh, they died before 25 days of age, um, and they had uh, massive uh, expansion of uh, immune cell populations in the spleen and the lymph node. And you can see in the bottom picture that they're actually quite small and wasting away. And in fact, you can wait until the mouse becomes an adult, um, and so it's had Tregs during this whole time, and then just deplete Tregs uh, in an adult mouse, and within a week or so, these mice will also develop a very severe uh, and fatal uh, autoinflammatory disease. More specifically, Tregs will control particular types of autoimmunity. And one nice example is the development of type 1 diabetes in uh, a mouse model called the NOD mouse. Now, when Tregs are there, these FOXP3 positive uh, regulatory T cells, uh, autoimmunity does not develop or develops very slowly. Whereas if you um, get rid of Tregs, it will develop um, much, much more quickly. You can add in Tregs, and what you find is that these animals that got um, uh, diabetes really, really quickly uh, would now develop it much, much later, uh, off scale uh, on the time frame that I'm showing you. So um, then I'd just like to finish by talking a little bit about the different effector mechanisms that regulatory T cells use. Um, there are several. Uh, one is by the production of um, anti-inflammatory cytokines, such as IL-10 or IL-35. Um, the second uh, is by actually killing uh, the effector T cell. Third, they um, disrupt uh, the metabolism of the cell. For example, I mentioned that regulatory T cells have high levels of the high affinity IL-2 receptor. So they can act for a sink, act as a sink for sucking up all this IL-2, which is actually required uh, for the health of the effector T cells. And then lastly, uh, Tregs can uh, affect um, other types of cells, antigen presenting cells uh, in the region and uh, stop them uh, from um, triggering uh, an immune response, either by killing the cell 
or changing what type of cytokines uh, these cells make. So this is uh, um, a quite complex um, uh, mechanistic scenario, and people in the field have been asking, uh, is it the case that every single Treg cell is able uh, to do these different types of uh, inhibition? Uh, and if so, when does one come into play and the other uh, replace it? Or is it that in any kind of uh, Treg response, there are heterogeneous uh, set of cells there, some of which are uh, specialized in doing mechanism one, and others in mechanism four, and others in mechanism three. And that's something which uh, the field is very interested in determining at the moment. So I just finished by saying that regulatory T cells are um, a very uh, exciting field at the moment in immunology, that there's a lot of interest in actually using them to um, control autoimmune diseases or other inflammatory diseases uh, by uh, taking them out, expanding them, and reintroducing them into uh, individuals with various diseases. Thank you.